The following announcement has been paid for by the New Wealth Manager Advisory Club. Hey everybody, it's the president of the Wealth Manager Advisory Club, Jack Mitchell here. Welcome back to another exciting WMA Club meeting. Before I send you guys off to this awesome meeting you guys better watch today, a couple announcements on our end as always. First of all, um, you probably are wondering, well, wait, we had a meeting this week? Yes, we did on Tuesday with Prime America. And yes, today, obviously, but it, like I said on the Tuesday meeting, this is not in person, which means basically this has already been pre recorded already. The presentation you guys are about to watch today. Obviously, this has been live streamed on all our social media platforms, and they will be up. But you guys are probably watching it right now, which is already up on all our social platforms. So, again, you know, just let you guys know what's happening there. Second thing, uh, I want to thank each and every single one of you who supported us during the FDU in person career fair with your support and obviously with the backing of FDU Silverman. And on top of that, the FDU Career Development Center, we had a grand total of 250 people. I'm not joking when I said that. 250 people showed up with around 90 companies and firms. All were there, and believe me, I went there today just to look at a quick peek of it. Oh my God, I have never seen a gymnasium that full in my life. Besides the first day of school, obviously. If anyone was living East Hammer, you probably understand. But again, nobody did. So, um, thank you, thank you again so much for supporting us through that career fair. And do not forget, we are co-hosting another career fair, the virtual career fair on March 1st, so right over here. See right here, virtually March 1st. It will be via handshake, so obviously sign up via handshake. Click the link in our link tree below. Sign up through your school account, and you'll all be set. I know there are a couple of firms there. I think I know right off the top of my head. I think uh, Colin Resnick's going to be there, and I believe Pete Keffel Connors Davies will be there for the accounting and finance majors. So obviously, even though this career fair is geared towards general majors, we need to leave you guys out in the dust. So that's that. Finally, we have added, we've actually not added, but we filled in two of our meetings for the semester. One, which is a bonus meeting, and one, which is one of our regular meetings for the semester. So, hold on. Okay. No, 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 no. Better than, hold on. There we go. All right, so obviously, um, I know most of you guys were probably wondering, well, wait, why is Grant Thorne coming out on April 20th and not the 28th? Well, um, there were some mis delay, miscommunication, and they will now be coming in on April 20th on, I think, 4 p.m. in the mansion room 12, Dixon Hall room 1104, Zoom, a couple of WMA club socials as well. So then you're probably wondering, well, wait, Jack, if Grant Thorne's not coming on the 28th, who's going to speak to us on the 28th? And we are sure as hell we're not going to forfeit the meeting. Absolutely not. We're not going to give you, we're not going to, you know, give a meeting. No way. What we've decided to do is actually talk to you guys a little more about wealth management by talking about estate planning, investment planning, investment strategies, wealth transfer, and philanthropy. I know. Philanthropy, I'm like, really? That applies to WMA? Yes, it does. And that will be held on the 28th, so it'll be held next Tuesday, 6 p.m. in the Mansion Room 13, Dickinson Hall, Room 1170, Zoom, WMA Club Socials, and guess who will be the head of this workshop? This guy right here. Yes, yeah, so it'll be an awesome, awesome night. Uh, can't, believe, can't wait to talk to you guys about estate planning, investment planning, investment strategies, wealth transfer, and philanthropy. I'm still currently at the moment still making up the uh, PowerPoints of those. And do not worry, at the end of that meeting, you will get the slide decks to keep for yourselves. Um, and then, yeah, so let me get rid of this. All right. Lastly, just a reminder, make sure you follow all, all of our social media accounts, the official WMA Club social media accounts, and our official WMA Club website. Not, not the one that other people are telling you to make. The one that we have. And just as a disclaimer, obviously, for this meeting, obviously you guys are going to get the slide deck that um, was presented today, which I will be presenting to you guys today. I mean, even though I already pre-recorded pre myself doing this, you, you guys get the point, obviously. All right, so with that being said, if you guys are ready, and I know I am most certainly am ready, let's get you guys off of the meeting. <laughs> Thank you.
And now, our feature presentation. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting WMA club meeting. First of all, I hope you guys enjoyed the in-person career for you guys attended today. Obviously, we did a whopping total of 250 students that attended today. So I appreciate you guys all going out supporting FDU Silverman, FDU Career Center, and also ourselves at MA Club. So obviously, this is the meeting you guys are supposed to be here for. However, I sent you guys off to the career fair to go and do that. So today, we're talking about investment and risk management. Yes, it's another workshop hosted by yours truly, Jack Mitchell. All right, uh, let me get my slide deck up here. She had some technical difficulties earlier when um, going live. We probably are going to switch over to Restream, by the way. We're not going to be doing Fluton. It's just, it just messed everything up today. It just messed everything up. So just a little disclaimer there. <laughs> All right, let's get this going. Make sure I have my slide deck up. My notes are here. All righty, let's get this party started. All right, so investment and risk management workshop hosted by yours truly, WMA Club President Jack Mitchell. All right, so we have a lot to cover today in just so little time. Hopefully we get through all of it before five o'clock. All right, so today's, oh, skip. All right, all right. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about investment management and just a couple of things we're going to mention off this agenda here. Um, what is investment management, creating an investment plan, asset allocation, the types of investments, even going into performance measure and evaluation and market analysis and forecasting. And then when we go on the risk management, I know it seems like a lot, but do not worry, you guys are going to get the best coverage here on what is investment management, uh, risk management. We're talking about what is risk management, the types of risks that are out there, and we're also the risk management process. We're then also going to talk about risk appetite tolerance, risk reporting, risk management tools and techniques, and so much more. And by the way, as a disclaimer, you guys are all going to get this slide deck the day after this meeting. So obviously, Friday, you guys are going to get it all right then and there to keep, do whatever you want with it, maybe use it to good use. All righty, so here we go with investment management. So you guys are probably all wondering, uh, what is investment management? Well, investment management refers to the professional management of investments on behalf of clients in order to achieve their investment goals. The purpose of investment management is to help individuals and organizations make sound investment decisions that align with their financial objectives and risk tolerance. Investment managers use a range of tools and strategies to create a management and investment portfolios that meet the unique, unique needs of their clients. These are the various types of investment management services providers on this list. So I'm going to talk about a couple of you. And by the way, if you want a more detailed um, version of these, they're going to be in the uh, speaker notes of the slide deck. So I'm not going to read everything word for word, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of them that kind of catch my eye. So I'm going to talk about, and probably I think I don't everyone should know by now, um, financial advisors. So these are professionals who provide personalized investment advice and portfolio management services to clients. Financial advisors may be specialized for particular areas such as retirement planning or tax management, by the way, as, as a uh, heads up, we are going to be doing a retirement planning workshop on the 16th of March. Yes, that will be live streaming our social media platforms and not going to be a live in-person meeting. Just want to say that. Um, one actually, I think most people have probably never heard of before, robo-advisors. You might be probably thinking, well, wait, Jack, robots? No. It's technically online advisors. These are online platforms that use algorithms to provide autom automated investment advice and portfolio management services. These are typically low cost and can be a good option for individuals with smaller investment portfolios. And I think everyone should know wealth management. Heck, that's really the first two names of our club, wealth management. Um, well, these are companies that offer a range of investment management services, including financial planning, investment advice, and portfolio management. Wealth management firms typically serve high net worth individuals and families. So let's now talk about the investment management process. So the investment management process includes the following steps, setting investment goals, creating an investment plan, selecting investments, and monitoring and adjusting portfolio. So basically, if I remember, we are going to talk about each of these more in depth. But just as a little snippet here, risk management diversification are also important considerations of the investment management process. So let's talk about step number one, the investment management process, which is setting investment goals. Setting clear and specific investment goals is a critical component of successful investment management. 
It helps to guide investment decisions, measure performance, and stay on track to achieve financial objectives. Some important reasons for, settling, for setting investment goals include providing direction, measuring process, and enhancing discipline. And there are different types of investment goals. So some people like to see growth, income, person preservation, social responsibility investing. By the way, we did a fleet invest come in two weeks ago, talk about social responsibility investing, ESG investing, and retirement investing. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all those, but again, they're in speaker notes as well. So, oh, one way to click there. <laughs> now let's talk about creating an investment plan. So an investment plan is a comprehensive strategy that outlines specific steps an investor will take to achieve their financial objectives. It typically includes several key components, including asset allocation, diversification, and risk management. Basically, I will talk about those in more in depth when we get towards the um, towards the end of this presentation. To create an investment plan that aligns your investment goals, here are some steps to follow. And you can do this in any other order, but I feel like you guys should do it this order. Determine your investment goals. Assess your risk tolerance. Determine your time horizon. Choose your asset allocation. Select your investments and monitor and adjust your portfolio. Hmm. It kind of sounds like what we do at the Student Management Investment Fund Club every Tuesday at 4 p.m. in the Bloomberg Lab Club Forum in the Metro Campus. I was able to tie that in on this presentation. So yes. <laughs> okay, so let's now talk about asset allocation. So asset allocation is the process of dividing an investment portfolio among different asset classes, such as stocks and bonds and real estate and cash, based on the investor's financial goals, risk tolerance, and investment time horizon. Asset allocation is an important component of the investment management because it has significant impact on the portfolio's performance and risk. And there are different types of assets that we included in a portfolio, like I've already stated earlier, which I think everyone should probably know what these are by now. Also, REITs can actually be considered under real estate. Just want to throw that in there. And just to continue on with that, to determine how to allocate these assets to the portfolio, investors should consider their investment goals, risk tolerance, and investment time horizon, like I already said already. For example, a long-term investor with a high risk tolerance may choose to allocate a larger portion of the portfolio to stocks, while a more conservative investor with a shorter time horizon may prefer a larger allocation of bonds and cash. And there are three different types of approaches to asset allocation. So there's strategic, there's tactical, and there's dynamic. And I believe if I remember, if I look here at my slides, just want to make sure I... If I did talk about these, no, I did not talk about these in depth. Okay, so I guess I, I will talk about these now, actually, because I didn't go more in depth in them. So strategic asset allocation. So this involves establishing a long-term asset allocation plan based on the investor's goals, risk tolerance, and time horizon, and maintaining this allocation over time. Tactical asset allocation, which involves making short-term adjustments to the asset allocation based on the market conditions or other factors. And the dynamic asset allocation, this involves making ongoing adjustments to the asset allocation based on the changes in the market or the investor's financial goals. Now, let's talk about diversification. Diversify the portfolio. As I always say in sleep, let's diversify the portfolio. <laughs> diversification is the concept of spreading investment risk across different assets or types of investments. It is a poor strategy in investment management because it helps to minimize the impact of losses in any one particular investment and provide a more stable return on investment, or ROI, if anyone wants to do abbreviations here. <laughs> the idea behind diversification is that by investing in a mix of assets, such as stocks and bonds and real estate and cash, as I said on the previous slide, an investor can reduce the overall risk of their portfolio. This is because the performance of different assets tends to be influenced by different factors. So how do I diversify portfolio? Well, investors should consider investing in different asset classes, like for example, I know, I think for student management investment, we'll probably invest in communication stocks, invest in finance, and soon we'll be investing in REITs, actually. Oops, gave that away. Shouldn't be giving that away, though. <laughs> All right. So, for example, within the stock asset classes, an investor might choose to invest in different industries, like technology, healthcare, consumer goods. Within the bond asset classes, an investor might choose to invest in bonds issued by different companies or governments with varying credit ratings. It is also important to consider the geographical location of investments. And economic conditions and policies can vary, can vary widely between different regions. So like basically economic conditions in the U.S. are not the same as the ones in the U.K. as the ones in Japan and Germany, as an example. So when diversifying portfolios, it's important to consider the investor's investment goals, the risk tolerance, and their investment time horizon. A diversified portfolio could still involve a little bit of risk. But by spreading investments across different asset classes, an investor could potentially reduce the overall risk of their portfolio. Now let's talk about a little bit about risk management. I know I'm going to talk about that in the second half of the presentation. So only going to talk about a little bit about it. Don't worry, we're going to get to all that in a little bit. 
So risk management is a crucial component of investment management. So the primary goal of risk management is to minimize potential for investment losses by identifying and managing the various risks associated with investing. So again, I'm not going to talk about the second bullet point because that basically gives you guys the spoiler to what the second half of the presentation is. So we're going to skip that part. And we're going to go to the next one, which is now, let's talk about now the types of investments. So there are a lot of investment types. So, oh, I don't know why uh, Zoom wants to be an idiot today. <laughs> Technology. So there are a bunch of investments, like I said earlier, and we are going to talk about each one of these and how to invest in each of them. So like I said, there are stocks, there's bonds, there's mutual funds, there's ETFs, and there's alternative investments. So we're going to go through each one of these and talk about how you're able to invest and actually manage your investments with each of these investments types. So first one, which is stock investing. So investing in stocks is involving buying ownership shares in publicly traded companies. So for example, Apple, Disney, um, Rumble, <laughs> Rumble. <laughs> if anyone get the joke there, you pat yourself on the back. Right? <laughs> um, stocks can be bought and sold through a broker's account. Investors can choose to invest in individual stocks or they can invest in a diversified portfolio of stocks through a mutual fund or exchange traded fund, ETF. For example, the Student Managed Investment Fund Club. That is an example of diversified portfolio. It's an example. Stock prices are typically quoted at the price per share of the company's stock, and the stock price can fluctuate throughout the day based on supply and demand. As affected by various factors such as the company's financial performance, industry trends, and global economic conditions. Investors can evaluate a company's financial health by reviewing its financial statements, which includes a balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. I know most of you guys are probably going to take advanced accounting in FDU. Um, you're probably going to hear that a lot. So. Just want to forewarn you about those three types of financial statements. Balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. Key financial metrics to look for include revenue growth, profitability, debt levels, and cash flow. Investors could also look at other factors, such as the company's competitive position in the industry and the quality of its management team. Investing in stocks involves risk, as the value of the stocks can fluctuate significantly over time. Investors can manage risk by diversifying their portfolio across different stocks and asset classes and by investing them for the long term rather than the time the market, like we're doing in the SMEF. I got to stop tying them both together. I, I got to stop. <laughs> anyway, when investing in a company stock, investors can either purchase a stock directly from the company or through a stock broker. They can also choose to invest in a mutual fund or an ETF that includes the company stock as a part of a diversified portfolio. All right, we talked about one type of investment. Let's talk about the next type, which is bond investing. Investing in bonds includes buying debt securities issued by corporations, governments, or other organizations. These are different types of bonds that investors could choose from. Government bonds are issued by governments, such as the U.S. Treasury, and they're considered to be relatively safe investments. Corporate bonds are issued by a corporation. Obviously, you know, simple. Corporate bonds issued by corporations. Easy. And are considered to be riskier than government bonds. Municipal bonds are issued by state and local government. They can provide tax advantages for investors. And these bonds can be purchased through a broker's account, the same like with stock investing, or directly from the user. Issuer. Investors can also invest in bonds funds, which provide exposure to a diversified portfolio of bonds. When buying and selling bonds, investors should be aware of the transaction costs and the bid-ask spreads. Bonds risk include credit risk, interest rate risk, inflation risk, just to name a few. Credit risk refers to the risk that the issuer may default on its payments. Interest rate risk refers to the risk that the change in the interest rate may affect the value of the bond. And inflation risk refers to the risk that the inflation may reduce the real value of the bond's returns. Investors can evaluate these risks by reviewing the bond credit rating, maturity date, and the yield. And investors can manage the bond risk by, like I said already, diversifying the portfolio across different types of bonds and inve by investing in bonds funds and provide exposure to a diversified portfolio of bonds. They can also invest in inflation-protected bonds or bonds funds, which can also be protected against inflation risks. And when investing in bonds, investors can choose to invest in individual bonds or bond funds. They should also consider for their investment objectives, risk tolerance, time horizon, like I said earlier in the previous slides. So the next type is mutual fund investing or uh oh <laughs> we're having a little tech difficulties. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. So mutual funds are investment vehicles that pool money from many investors to purchase the portfolio stocks, bonds, or other securities. When you invest in a mutual fund, your money is combined with money from other investors to create a large pool of funds. The fund is managed by a professional investment manager who uses the money to purchase a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds or other securities. The value of the mutual fund is determined by the net asset value or the NAV or the fund's holdings. There are different types of mutual funds, including index funds and actively managed funds. 
Index funds are designed to track specific market index, such as example, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, NASDAQ. Actively managed funds are managed by a professional investment manager who tries to outperform the market by making strategic investment decisions. An investor can evaluate a mutual fund's performance by reviewing its historical returns, expense ratio, and risk profile. Historical returns provide an indication of how the fund has performed over time, although past performance is not necessarily in, 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 the, in, indicative of future results. The expense ratio is the percentage of the fund's assets that are used to pay for the fund's management and other expenses and can be impact the fund's overall returns. And then finally, the risk profile of a mutual fund can be evaluated by reviewing its volatility, the standard deviation, and the beta. Then mutual funds can be purchased through a brokerage account or directly through the mutual fund company. And investors could consider their investment objectives and the same stuff I said about the past two investing. So continuing on with that is exchange-traded funds or ETF investing. So ETF investings are similar to mutual funds in that they are investment vehicles that pool money for many investors to purchase a portfolio, stocks, and bonds or other securities. However, what makes ETF investing different than the mutual fund investing is that ETFs are traded on stock exchange, like individual stocks, and they can be bought and sold throughout the day, like stocks. So, yeah. <laughs> ETFs are designed to track a specific market index, such as the S&P 500, or specific asset classes, the bonds. When you issue an ETF, you're buying a share of the diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds of securities that are designed to track the performance of underlying index or asset classes. There are different types of ETFs, including index ETFs and actively managed ETFs. Index ETFs are designed to track specific in market index of the S&P 500. Actively managed ETFs are managed by a professional investment manager who tries to outperform the market and make strategic investment decisions. So basically, they can do the same thing as mutual funds, but the only difference here is that basically ETFs are traded on the stock exchange like individual stocks. So basically, it's everything that I just said on the previous slide but only that one little thing I mentioned here. So now let's talk about real estate investing. So real estate investing involves, well, purchasing and acquiring property. That's what real estate is, property, with the intention of generating income or appreciation of value. Real estate investing can take many forms, including purchasing rental properties, investing in REITs, famous on where REITs stand for, and stands for Real Estate Investment Trust, or participating in real estate crowdfunding platforms. Real estate investing provided an opportunity to generate steady rental income and capital appreciation over time. However, it also comes with risks such as vacancy rates, property damages, and interest rate fluctuations. Additionally, real estate investments can require a significant amount of upfront capital and ongoing maintenance costs. Investors consider the factors such as the property's location, the condition, the potential for rental income when evaluating a real estate investment. Additionally, you should also calculate the property's potential ROI Take into account factors such as the property purchase price, expected rental income, and maintenance costs. Rental properties are a common way to invest in real estate, where investors purchase properties with the intention of renting them out to tenants. REITs are another popular way to invest in real estate, which allow investors to own shares in a portfolio of income-generating properties without the need to manage the properties themselves, which basically is saying doing it the lazy way instead of putting in the hard work and dedication. Real estate crowding fund platforms allow investors to pull their money together to invest in large real estate projects, such as apartment buildings or commercial properties. So, two more left. We have fixed income investments. So, fixed income investments are financial products that pay investors a fixed rate of return over a specific period of time. These types of investments are often considered less riskier than stocks because they provide a consistent stream of income and typically have a lower volatility rate. When you purchase a fixed income security, you are essentially loaning the money to the issuer, and in return, you receive a fixed rate of interest over a specific period of time. And there are various types of fixed income investments, including bonds, CDs, which are certificate of deposits, and money market funds. I'm not going to talk about bonds. I think everyone should know that by now. But just to talk about the other two that I think some of you guys do not know about, certificate of deposits or CDs are typically issued by banks, and they offer a fixed rate of return over a specific period of time. And money market funds are a type of mutual fund that invests in short-term and low-risk debt securities. Fixed income investments are generally considered less riskier than stocks, and they often stay, offer a steady stream of income and typically less volatile. However, as in life, there are always risks. And there is still a risk of default, which is when the issuer is unable to pay back the principal of in or the interest. Additionally, fixed income investments may not offer as much potential for capital appreciation as stocks. When evaluating a fixed income investment, it's important to consider factors such as the credit worthiness of the issuer, the yield or the rate of return, and the maturity date. Investors should also consider the current interest rate environment and whether the investment fits within their overall investment objectives and risk tolerance. 
Finally, we have alternative investments. So alternative investments are non-traditional assets that are generally not traded on the public stock exchange. They can include hedge funds, private equities, real estate to a degree, real estate to a degree, commodities and other types of assets. So there's things to keep in mind when investing in alternative investments. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them right now. Hedge funds. So if anyone's not know what a hedge fund is, hedge funds are investment vehicles that are managed by professional fund managers. They typically use a variety of strategies to generate returns, including long, short equity, merge, arbitrate, or arbitrate. I apologize if I butchered that. I apologize. And event-driven investing. Hedge funds are generally only available to accredited investors due to their high minimum investment requirements. We also have private equity, which private equity involves investing in private companies that are not publicly traded. For example, um, a stock that I know is probably not a stock but right now, Getter or... Yeah, so I want to come on the top of my head. Shout out to one of our sponsors, Getters. <laughs> um, this can include venture capital investments in startups, for example. Like I'm the COO of a startup company called Buddy, which is a mental health guide here towards college students. That can be put into a private equity or a venture capital. Leveraging buyouts of established companies or investments in real estate. Private equity investors typically have a long, longer time horizon than traditional investors and are looking for a higher potential returns over several years. We then have commodities, which basically commodities are physical goods, such as gold and silver, oil, or any agricultural products that are traded on the commodities exchange. Commodities can be used as a hedge against inflation and market volatility, and can also be used to diversify a portfolio. Now, there are some risks and benefits of alternative investments. I'm going to tell you what these are. So alternative investments can provide a higher potential return than the traditional investments, but like I said with the past investments we talked about earlier, they also can be risky. They may also be less liquid and have higher fees than traditional investments. Additionally, alternative investments can be more difficult to value and may require specialized knowledge to, proper, to properly evaluate. And how does alternative investments fit into a diversified portfolio, you may be asking. Well, alternative investments can provide a diversification benefits to a portfolio, as they are typically less correlated with traditional investments such like stocks and bonds including a variety of alternative investments in a portfolio that can help mitigate risk and potentially increase returns. However, investors should be aware of the risk and do their due diligence before investing in the alternative assets. So now let's talk about performance measurement and the evaluation. So measuring investment performance is an essential or key part of evaluating the success of investment strategy. And here's some tips to help measure investment performance. Define the investment objectives and goals. Establish benchmarks. Calculate performance metrics, evaluate performance, get the benchmark and the metrics, and then adjust the investment strategy. I'm not going to talk about the first one because I think it's very easy to talk about the investment objectives and goals, like setting like goals for yourself. I'll talk about the other ones. Just go more in depth. Benchmarks are used to measure the performance of an investment portfolio against a standard. Common benchmarks include the S&P 500 for U.S. stocks or the Barclays Aggregated Bonds Index for fixed income. Benchmarks should be relevant to the portfolio and its goals. And then calculating the performance metrics. So there's common metrics, including alpha, beta, standard deviation, like we talked about previously. Alpha measures an investment risk adjusted return, while beta measures the volatility of an investment compared to the benchmark. Standard deviation measures the volatility of an investment over a period of time. Then you would evaluate the performance against those benchmarks and the metrics, which basically is what I just said there. You evaluate them. Once the best risk metrics are established, for can be evaluated over time, it's important to look at long-term trends rather than short-term fluctuations. And if necessary, adjust the investment strategy. We think it will probably happen at some point. Based on the evaluation of the portfolio performance, adjustments can be made to the investment strategy. For example, if the portfolio is not meeting its benchmark, the allocation may need to be adjusted to increase diversification or reduce risk. And then finally, to end out the investment management part of the workshop here, we're talking about market analysis and forecasting. So market analysis and forecasting is another essential part of investment management. So here's some of the basics of the market analysis and forecast. Oh, and by the way, just to get, oh, all right, all right, hit that there, okay. Uh, basics of market analysis and forecast. So understand the market, identify market indicators, analyze market trends, forecast market movements, and stay in form. So understand the market, you have the first step basically is to understand the market and the factors that influence it. These factors, like I said in the previous slides already, economic indicators such as gross domestic product or GDP, inflation rates, and interest rates, as well as global events such as geopolitical tensions, pandemics like COVID-19 as an example, or natural disasters. 
like, I don't know if you really qualify this as a natural disaster, even though it's actually no, you wouldn't. Uh, geopolitical tensions would be the war between Ukraine and Russia, as an example. Then you identify market indicators. So market indicators are quantitative measures that provide insight into the current and future state of the markets. Common indicators include stock market in, in, uh, indices, such as the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, bond yields, and commodity prices. Then analyze the market trends. So once the market indicators have been identified, it is important to analyze them and identify trends. This may, be, this may include identifying our support and resistance levels for stocks for analyzing technical indicators, such as moving averages, or related strength index or RSI. Then we have forecast market movement. So based on the analysis of the market indicators and trends, investors can make informed forecasts about the future market movements. This may involve predicting future price movements for individual stocks or identifying broader market trends and making investment decisions accordingly. And finally, staying informed. Market analysis and forecasting an ongoing process. And it's important to stay informed about new developments and changes in the market. This may include reading financial news reports, attending industry conferences, events, or consulting with investment professionals. For example, going to markets update every 3 p.m. in the Bloomberg Labs with FD alumni John Budish and Rich Brenner. Attend that. And also, I actually am going to coin this from John Budish because he did tell me this. I think the very first week I met him during Sneep. Take a minute out of your day and look at the stock. Look at the look at the news. Look at the stock market. For one minute, and that's it. You don't have to stare at it every single minute, but just take a minute to look at it. So overall, market analysis and forecasting is an important aspect of investment management. By understanding market indicators, analyzing market trends, and making informed forecasts, investors can make more informed investment decisions and improve their chances of achieving their investment goals. All right. So before I go to the next one, we want to make a quick little break here. Talk a lot today. Yeah, that little 30 second break there. All right, so now it's time for the second part of our workshop, which now we're gonna talk about risk management. Yes, the word no one really wants to hear in life, risk. You don't wanna take risk, you wanna play it safe. Unless you're that daredevil who wants to go take all the risk in life, go do it. But again, I really like to take the risk. I like to play it safe, in my opinion. So what is risk management? Risk management is the process of identifying, ass assessing, prioritizing, and mitigating risks that may affect an organization or individual's ability to achieve their objectives. It is an essential component of any business or activity that involves uncertainty and perpetual hazards. Effective risk management helps to mi minimize the potential negative impact of risks on business operations, financial performance, reputation, and other aspects of life. The importance of this is that it varies across different fields, but its significance cannot be overstated. In finance and investing, risk management is especially crucial. Financial markets are inherently unpredictable, and investing involves the potential for both the gains and the losses. Effective risk management can help investors and mitigate their exposure to potential losses and protect their investment portfolio. It can also, it can also help to balance the risks and returns of different investments, ensuring that the portfolio is diversified and well-managed. Without proper risk management, investors are more likely to suffer significant losses during the market's downturns, economic crises, or unforeseen events, which I've been hearing for some people that they might be going to recession soon. I'm not going to say who told me that, but again, I'm just going to say that. Overall, risk management is a crucial practice that should be incorporated to every single business and personal decision-making process. It helps individuals and organizations navigate uncertainty, making informed decisions, and protect themselves from potential harm or loss. By understanding and managing risk, people can increase their chances of success and achieve their goals with greater confidence. So we broke, we talked about risk management, but to break down risk even further, for anyone who does not know what risk is, if you don't want to look in the dictionary, no offense, but risk refers to the uncertainty of potential loss that is inherent in any investment decision. It is the possibility that an investment may not perform as expected, resulting in a lower return than anticipated or a complete loss of the invested capital. Now we're gonna talk about the types of risk. And there are two, four, eight types of risk, which I'm gonna talk about all of them right now. We have market risk, credit risk, operational risk, liquidity risk, reputational risk, legal regulatory risk, model risk, and cybersecurity. So Jason, the ones I just read to you guys when I did my research of this, they probably uh, three, Four, four of them I know about. The other three, I just don't know. 
So let's dive into all of them, starting with market risk. Market risk, also known as systematic risk, is the potential for an investment's value to be affected by fluctuations in the overall market or by specific events that impact a particular industry or company. Market risk is a type of risk that cannot be eliminated through diversification since it affects the entire market and not just in a portfolio or a single stock. It is typically measured by the beta's coefficient, which indicates an investment's sensitivity to changes in the market. Market risk can have a significant impact on investment portfolio as it leads to a decline in the values of assets or even a complete loss of invested capital. It is especially relevant in volatile markets, economic downturns, or during periods of geopolitical uncertainty. So to mitigate this, investors can opt up various strategies including diversification and hedging, which I've already talked about that in the first part of our presentation today. But just to give you a little refresher what hedging is, hedging is another strategy that can be used to mitigate market risk. Hedging involves taking position in a derivative derivative, such as options or futures, that is opposite to the investor's exposure to the market. And again, in addition to diversification and hedging, investors can also mitigate market risk by investing in low volatility assets, such as bonds, cash, or defensive stocks, which tend to be less affected by market fluctuations. They can also adopt a long-term investing strategy and avoid market impulsive decisions based on the short-term market movements. I think I did have an example for this one. I think I did on my notes here. Oh, yeah. For example, an investor with a significant investment in stocks may hedge their position by purchasing put out options, which gives them right to sell the share at a specific price, even if the market price declines. So the next type of risk we talked about is credit risk. So credit risk is potential for an investor to suffer a loss through the failure of a borrower to repay the debt obligation, such as the principal and interest payments, as agreed. Is a type of risk that arises from lending money or investing in debt securities as prevalent in various asset classes such as bonds and loans and other fixed income instruments. Credit risk is a significant impact on the investment as it can lead to a reduction in the value of the investment or a complete loss of the invested capital, like I said earlier. A default or downgrade in the credit worthiness of a borrower can reduce the decline in the value of the bond or loan as well as a loss of interest payment. In severe cases, a default can actually lead to a bankruptcy. And a total loss of invested capital, which believe me, we don't want to see anyone in this club go bankrupt. So that's why we're telling you guys this now. <laughs> so to mitigate credit risk, investors can use various strategies, including credit analysis and credit default swaps, CDS. Credit default swaps, everyone does not know, which basically can be used to mitigate credit risk, which basically is a type of derivative that provides insurance against the risk of default on a particular bond or loan. So Next one is operational risk. Operational risk is a potential for loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal process systems or human errors in organization. It's a type of risk that is not related to the market or credit risk, but rather to the internal functions of an organization, such as the people, the process, or system. Operation risk can have a significant impact on investors as can result in financial losses, reputational damage, which I'll talk about a little bit about reputational risk, or even legal penalties. For example, if an investment firm fails to Im implement proper risk management procedures processes, it may face significant regulatory fines or lawsuits from clients. So how to mitigate this? Organizations can implement various strategies, including internal controls, business continuity plans, and third-party risk management. Internal controls include the pol pol policy procedures that an organization implements to ensure the accuracy and integrity of its financial operational data. This can include measures such as segregation of duties, authorization of approval processes, and periodic audits and reviews. Business continuity plans are another strategy that can be used to mitigate operational risk. These plans outline the steps of an organization will take in the event of an unexpected disruption to their operations, such as a natural disaster or cyber attack, which I'll talk about that cyber attack risk in a little bit. The plan should identify critical processes and systems and outline how they will be restored to ensure business continuity and minimize losses. And then we have third-party risk management. This involves evaluating the risk associated with the organization's third-party vendors and suppliers, such as their financial stability, information security practices, and regulatory compliance. By managing third-party, an organization can ensure that their vendors and suppliers are meeting the same operational standards and risk management protocols as the organization itself. So, next is liquidity risk. Liquidity risk is the potential for loss resulting from the ability to quickly and efficiently sell an investment without incurring significant losses. It is a type of risk that arises from the difficulty of converting an investment into cash quickly and at a fair market value, or FMV. The quantity of risk can have a significant impact on the investments as it can lead to reduction in the value of the investment or complete loss of the investment capital. 
So to mitigate this, investors can use various strategies, including maintaining su su sufficient cash reserves, diversifying their investments, and carefully managing portfolio allocations. And another strategy is to carefully manage portfolio allocations. So by monitoring the liquidity of the investment in the portfolio, investors can avoid investing in assets that are e-liquid or difficult to sell. This could include maintaining an appropriate allocation of cash and short-term securities, such as money market funds, which are provide high liquidity and low volatility. Investors can also mitigate liquidity risk by using tools such as stop loss orders, which automatically trigger the sale of an investment if it reaches the predetermined price. This can help to limit losses and provide a way to quickly liquidate an investment if necessary. So now we're talking about reputation risk. Yes, the one that I talked about probably two slides ago about operational risk. Now we're talking about reputational risk. So reputational risk is the potential for loss resulting from damage to an organization's reputation or brand. And it's the type of risk that arises from negative publicity, customer dissatisfaction, or ethical or legal issues that could lead to a loss of public trust. So reputational risk could have significant impact on the investment as it could lead to decline in the value of organization stock, the loss of customers, and increased regulatory scrutiny. For example, at one point, basically, when Elon Musk bought Twitter, the Tesla stock went down, and now it's going back up, as an example. So to mitigate this, organizations can use various strategies, including managing stakeholders' expectations, establishing ethical business practices, and maintaining open communication with their stakeholders. So basically, establishing ethical business practices is also important. This can include implementing policies and procedures that ensure compliance with legal and regulatory requirements, as well as promoting a culture of integrity and transparency through the organization. With maintaining open communication with their stakeholders, which that involves engaging with stakeholders regularly, responding promptly to their concerns, and addressing any issues that may arise in a timely and transparent and orderly manner. And there are other strategies that can help you know, mitigate this risk, including conducting regular risk assessments, monitoring social media, and other online channels for negative feedback, and implement a crisis management plan in the event of an adverse event. Now we move on to legal and regulatory risk. Oh, all right, there we go. So legal and regulatory risk is potential for loss resulting from changes in the laws, regulations, or court decisions that impact an organization's operation. It is a type of risk that arises from uncertainty surrounding the legal and regulatory environment in which an organization operates. So legal regulatory risk can have a significant impact. It can lead to legal liabilities, fines, or a loss of a business due to noncompliance with legal and regulatory requirements. For example, a company that fails to comply with environmental regulations may face fines legal action, which can result in the decline of the value of the company's shares. So to mitigate this, organizations can use various strategies, like adhering to legal requirements and staying up to date with regulatory changes. Adhering to these legal requirements involving complying with applicable laws and regulations, as well as implementing policies and procedures that ensure compliance. So staying up to date with regulatory changes basically is involved monitoring changes in the law and regulations that may impact the organization's operations that make any necessary changes to policy procedures. And there are other strategies to do this, like maintaining a strong corporate governance structure, putting a board of directors with relevant expertise and oversight, and implementing effective risk management and compliance. For example, we do have a board of advisors in SMEF. And after you, the board of trustees, as an example, a way to mitigate legal and regulatory risk. So now let's talk about model risk. So model risk is the potential for loss resulting from errors or limitations in quantitative models used in investment decision making. It is a type of risk that arises from the uncertainty and complexity of financial markets, which may lead to errors in the assumptions and predictions used in quantitative models. So model risk can have significant impact on investments because it can lead to incorrect investment decisions that may result in losses. For example, a model used to predict market trends may fail to take into account a significant market event, lead to incorrect investment decisions that result in a loss on the investor. So stress test, actually, to mitigate this risk, or as they may use various strategies, including conducting sensitivity analysis, stress testing, which could conducting stress sensitivity analysis involves examining the impact of different assumptions and impacts on the results of the model. And stress testing is another way, which basically involves subject in the model to extreme market scenarios that are unlikely, but could have a significant impact on the organization operations, kind of like a what if this happens scenario. And there's other strategies like implementing effective risk managers, we'll talk about that a little bit, compliance programs, including the use of independent third-party model validation and maintaining a strong corporate governance structure, including a board director with relevant expertise and oversight. Now we move on to cybersecurity risk. And yes, this is probably the one I never even thought I would actually have to say, but yes, there is cybersecurity risk in wealth management. Surprisingly, I, I actually just learned this today. 
So cybersecurity raises the potential for loss results from cyber threats or attacks on organizations, information, technology systems, network, and data. It is the type of risk that arises from increasing reliance on technology in the modern business environment and the growing sophistication and pre prevalence of cyber threats. So basically, they can have a significant impact as well, as they can lead to breaches of sensitive information, theft of intellectual property, the disruption of business operations. And these can also still re result in financial losses, damage to the reputation, and legal liabilities. I wish I had an example for this one, but I do not. So to mitigate this, or as issues use various strategies, including implementing security controls and establishing incident response plans. Implementing these security controls involves a range of activities to protect the organization's information, technology system, network, and data from cyber threats. So basically establishing incident response plans, which, which basically involves developing a plan of action to respond to cyber attacks, cyber threat or attack, including identifying the nature and scope of the attack, containing the attack, and recovering from the attack. And there are other strategies that can help mitigate this risk, including regular cybersecurity assessments and audits, educating employees on cybersecurity best practices, and implementing effective risk management and compliance program. So now let's talk about the risk management process. So the risk management process involves several steps that help organizations identify, assess, prioritize, treat, monitor, and review the risk. And funny enough, that's basically what the steps are. And I'm going to go through each and every single one of them with you guys. So here we go. The first one is risk identification. So the process of identifying risk involves identifying potential events or situations that may have an adverse impact on an organization, objective, project, or operations. Effective risk identification is crucial to the critical to the success of the risk management process as it helps organizations take proactive steps to manage risk before they become significant problems. So there are some steps of identifying these risks. I'm not really going to go over all of them. Actually, I'm going to go over all of them, but I'm going to go really in depth on them. So the steps are to define the scope, brainstorming, risk registers, scenario analysis, expert judgment, and historical data analysis. And for, and there are some examples of risk identification, like, for example, hazard analysis, Delphi technique, and SWOT analysis, which, by the way, as a plug, there's a task on suitable for SWOT analysis. It's for PDP points. Do it. <laughs> we'll tie that in as well. So. All right, now let's talk about risk assessment. So risk assessment is the process of evaluating the likelihood of potential impact of identified risk. The purpose of this process is to provide a quantitative or qualitative analysis on risk that will enable organizations to prioritize them and develop effective strategies to manage them. So the steps to assess these risks are big. <laughs> talk about risk treatment, how to treat the risk. After risk has been identified, assessed, and prioritized, the next step is develop risk treatment strategies to address them. Risk treatment involves developing and implementing plans to reduce the likelihood or impact of identified risk. And some examples of them, which funny enough, actually, they're a part of the risk management process, risk avoidance, risk reduction, risk transfer, and risk acceptance. So again, funny enough, this step actually applies to the previous, to some of the previous steps of risk management process. Now we're going to talk about risk monitoring and review. The final step in the risk management process is monitoring and reviewing risk. This involves regular, regularly assessing whether the risk management strategies that have been implemented are effective and whether they are any new risks that have emerged. The goal is to ensure that risks are managed effectively and that the organization is prepared to respond to any changes in the risk landscape. So there are examples of them, which basically are performance indicators, key risk indicators, KRIs, and risk audits. Now, let's talk about now risk culture. Yes, there is such a thing as risk culture. Believe me, this is the first I'm hearing about. 
So risk culture refers to the values, beliefs, and attitudes and behaviors of an organization with respect to risk management. It is a collective way in which people within an organization think about and approach the risk. The importance of risk culture and risk management cannot be overstated, like I stated earlier. A strong risk culture can help an organization identify and manage risks more effectively, while a weak risk culture can lead to poor risk management practices, resulting in significant financial, reputational, or operational harm. A positive risk culture is one where risk management is seen as a shared responsibility, as embedded in the organization's overall strategy, decision-making process, and their day-to-day -day activities. And on the other side of that coin, a negative risk culture is one where risk management is viewed as a compliance exercise or basically an afterthought, which, which basically means that no one really cares about it. And with little consideration given the potential impact of risk on the organization. Therefore, building and maintaining a positive risk culture is essential for the effective risk management. It requires leadership commitment and support, the establishment of clear roles and responsibilities, ongoing communication training, and the continuing continuous monitoring and evaluation of risk management practices. So let's talk about risk, appetite, and tolerance. Yes, you, you didn't know that risk can have appetite. Yeah, it can. So risk, appetite, and risk tolerance are important concepts in the risk management that are often used interchangeably but have different meanings. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain them to you. Risk appetite refers to the amount and type of risk an organization is willing to accept in pursuit of strategic objectives. It reflects the level of risk the organization is willing to take to achieve its goals and usually is set by senior management and the board directors. Then on the other hand, you have risk tolerance, which refers to the level of risk an organization is able to bear without jeopardizing its financial stability, operational effectiveness, or reputation. It is the maximum level of risk the organization can tolerate before it must take action, reduce, or is eliminated altogether. So based on the importance of these two lies in their ability to provide guidance and boundaries for decision-making. Furthermore, both risk appetite and tolerance can help an organization prioritize and allocate resources to risk management activities such as risk identification, assessment, and treatment, like I stated earlier. So let's talk about now risk reporting. Yes, if you know risk is happening, you better want to report it. So risk reporting is the process of collecting, analyzing, and communicating information about an organization's risk to stakeholders, including senior management, the board of directors, regulators, investors, and other interested parties. The importance of risk reporting lies in the ability to provide stakeholders with accurate and timely information about the organization's risk profile, risk management practices, and risk exposures. So now you may be wondering, well, wait, why should I even really care about risk reporting? Well, basically, it facilitates decision-making, it enhances transparency, it also supports compliance, it improves risk management, and also facilitates communication. I'm not going to go in depth about all of them, but again, if you want to go, go look at the speaker notes on slide 43 on that. And I'm not going to go through it because we are almost running out of time. I want to get this all done before five o'clock because the other class is coming here at 530. So next we have risk management. If my slides would like to work today. Oh, way too fast. There we go. All right. Risk management tools and techniques. So there are several co commonly used risk management tools and techniques that can be applied to different industries and fields. So Examples of those are SWOT analysis, like I stated earlier, PESTLE analysis, failure mode and effective analysis, FMEA, Monte Carlo simulation, value at risk, VAR, and root cause analysis, RCA. So let's now talk about quantitative risk analysis. So quantitative risk analysis is a process that involves the use of numerical data to analyze and assess the probability and impact of various tasks, various risks, I'm sorry. It is a structured approach that utilizes statistical and mathematical techniques to estimate the likelihood of risks occurring and their potential impact on a project or business. So there are a couple of steps to quantitative risk analysis, which are identify the risk, define the impact of the risk, quantify the probability of occurrence, estimate the impact of the risk, calculate the expected value of risk, and then analyze the results. And the examples of quantitative risk analysis are sensitivity analysis and decision trees. So let's now go towards risk mitigation strategies. So risk mitigation is the process of implementing strategies and tactics to reduce or eliminate the likelihood or invest or impact of risk. There are many risk mitigation strategies that individuals and organizations can use to protect themselves from the effects of various risks. And the common risk mitigation strategies are contingency, contingency planning, crisis management, business continually planning, risk transfer, risk avoidance, risk reduction, risk acceptance, Funny enough, as a little hint to next week's meeting, which will be Tuesday, I'm actually talking about wealth transfer. Yeah, there is such a thing as wealth transfer. 
Just want to throw that in there. So we now are talking about risk assessment and project management. I know this is the wealth management advice, but I really talk a little bit about project management a little bit. Because again, risk assessment can be not only investments, but also can be involved in projects. What do you what I mean? Let me explain. Risk assessment is a critical part of project management as it helps to identify potential risks that can impact the project's success and create a plan to mitigate them. By conducting a thorough risk assessment, project managers can identify potential sources of risk and assess the likelihood and impact of each risk on the project's objectives. Risk assessment allows project managers to plan for potential risk and develop a response plan in case a risk occurs. This proactive approach enables project teams to reduce the likelihood of negative events occurring and minimize their impact on the project's success. And additionally, risk assessment helps project managers to allocate resources effectively as they can prioritize the risk and develop mitigation plans that align with the project's goals and objectives. This approach ensures that the project teams are prepared to handle risks that may arise through red cost deadly, costly delays, reworks, or failure, which we do not want anyone to fail in this club at all. So enterprise risk management. Now I'm going to talk about the three, the four, sorry, the five risk managers. First one being enterprise risk manager. So enterprise risk manager, ERM, a strategic and Holocaust approach, holistic approach to managing all types of risks across an organization. ERM considers risks from all sources and align them with the organization's overall strategy and objectives to help achieve its goals while protecting the assets. The importance of ERM lies in the ability to provide the comprehensive review of risk exposure, enabling effective risk management, and improving decision making at all levels of the organization. And here's some key components just to keep in mind about ERM the governments and culture, the risk assessment, the risk response, monitoring and reporting, information communication technology, and performance management. The next type of risk management is cybersecurity risk management. So cybersecurity risk management is the process of identifying, assessing, and mitigating cybersecurity risk to an organization's information systems and networks. In today's technology-dependent world, cybersecurity risks are increasing in both the number and complexity, making cybersecurity risk management crucial for all organizations, even big and small. And some examples of cybersecurity risk management techniques are vulner vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, security audits, security awareness training, and incident response training, that training planning. Next, we have financial risk management. So financial risk management is the practice of identifying, assessing, and mitigating financial risks that can impact an organization's financial health. Financial risk may arise from various factors, market volatility, changing interest rates, currency fluctuations, and credit risk. Effective financial risk management helps an organization protect against potential losses and make informed decisions on investments and funding strategies. And examples of those are basically two of them that I've already talked about already today, which basically are hedging and diversification. If you don't know what those two are, you forgot, you can rewind this, go to the point where I talk about hedging and diversification. You guys can learn about that before you get to here. Credit risk management, interest rate risk management, liquidity risk management, and capital adequacy management. So the next one is operational risk management. Operational risk is the risk of loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes of people and system for, or from external events. Operational risk management is a process that involves identifying, assessing, and managing the risks associated with an organization's operations. The importance of operational risk management lies in the ability to identify and mitigate risks that can impact an organization's ability to meet its objectives, maintain its reputation, and safeguard its assets. Operational risk managers can also help an organization comply with regulatory requirements and improve its overall efficiency and effectiveness. And some techniques of those are process mappings, control frameworks, internal audits, key risk indicators, like I talked about already on the other slide that I talked about already, and risk and control self-assessment, RCSAs. Finally, and before I do that, let me just take one last sip of this. That is strategic risk management. Strategic risk management is the process of identifying and mitigating risks that can affect an organization's strategic objectives. It involves a holistic approach to risk management, considering the potential impacts of risk of, or an organization's overall strategy, reputation, and future viability. So there's some key aspects of strategic risk management, which are identifying the strategic risk, assessing the likelihood and impacts of the risk, developing risk mitigation strategies, monitoring and reviewing the risk. And some common examples of strategic risks that organizations may face include changes in the market conditions, new competitors entering the market, disruptive technologies, geopolitical risk, and regulatory change. For example, back in 2007, when Apple released its iPhone, 
that enter the, you know, tech, you know, the phone business. Think about it. So to effectively manage strategic risk, organizations must take a proactive approach to risk management and develop a culture of risk awareness throughout the organization. This involves ensuring that all employees understand the importance of risk management and are trained to identify and manage risks that may impact the organization's strategic objective. And with that, that is the end of this workshop. Yes, I cannot believe we got through all of that. And believe me, the last time we did one of these, we legit went over the hour. We actually went over 30 minutes um, over. Uh, but thankfully, I was actually going to get this in under the hour. So amen to me. I was actually going to do that. All right. So again, you guys are going to have a copy of this slide deck. Obviously, I'll be sending them to your school emails at the end of probably Probably today, obviously. I'll probably send them out. Or actually, you know, maybe tomorrow I'll send them out. Tomorrow morning, you guys probably get it. But just to make sure you guys are aware of what's going to be happening next week, here's basically what's happening next week. Next Tuesday, you basically will have another treat. Yes, you get to hear me once again, but this time I am going to be talking about something different. No, it's not about invest. No, it's about a little bit about investing. Well, it's actually going to be five things. And I'm going to try and get them in all within an hour, hopefully. I'm going to talk about estate planning, investment planning, investment strategies, wealth transfer, and philanthropy. Yes, philanthropy plays a big part in wealth management. I'll be talking about those on Tuesday. That's in the mansion room 13, Dixon Hall room 70, Zoom, WMA Club Socials at 6 p.m. And hopefully by that time, we'll be having the new deal of Restream. So hopefully will that be in place. And then Wednesday, we'll be co-hosting the Spring 2023 Virtual Recruiting Fair with FU Silverman and the FU Careers Development Center. Obviously, that is on Handshake. So again, click the link in our link tree to basically sign up for that. And then we have a very, very special treat. Northwestern Mutual, Alyssa Sesh, Nicholas DiLorenzo, and Ashley DeOlio will be coming in person. And here's a fun fact. Ashley is a former, is an alumni of FU. And she just graduated last year. I actually didn't know that until I did the... Um, the social media description for the post you guys are about to see on Sunday. So that will be in room 12 here in the mansion. Dick is home room 11, 1104 and on Zoom and on our club socials as well. So with that being said, that is it for this week. Until next Tuesday, this is Jack Mitchell from the WMA Club saying so long. Have a great rest of your night and we'll see you guys all next week.